ACT, the testing timeline, when you should be taking these tests, and how we can help, the different strategies that you can use to improve your score, and then I'm going to answer any questions you have. So these are the tests that you're going to be looking at. For those of you who are sophomores, freshmen, your test grade year is the first year you're going to take the PSAT. Many of you have probably already done that. So then you're going to be looking at the SAT and the ACT. There's not one that is better than the other, and we'll talk more about that. Some of you will have to complete subject tests, which are specific to colleges that you're applying to. They might ask you to, to complete a specific subject test. And then if you're in an AP class, you're going to need to look at taking those AP tests so that you might be able to test out some of those credits so that you can get a head start when you get to college. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about. Okay, so what is on the SAT? People ask me a lot of the time, what is the difference between the SAT and the ACT? Okay, so we're going to break it down. This is what is actually going to be on the test. So some people are kind of surprised because they think, oh gosh, the math on the SAT is so hard. When really it's just arithmetic, algebra, and geometry, okay, which are all things that most of you will have completed by the time you get there. Why is it so hard? It's because of the way they ask you the questions, okay? So that's what the Princeton Review does. We help you to understand how these test writers come up with these test questions because it's not like your teachers think. And it's not the way most people think, and it's not the way that you normally will test when you're going through high school. Your reading portion is going to have all of these different kinds of sections, so critical reading, diction, vocabulary, passages, and sentence completion. We're going to look at some sample problems so that you can see how this is presented. And then you're going to have a writing portion, and for parents, this might be new to you because even when I took it, this was not part of the SAT. So now each one of these sections is worth 800 points. And so the most you can get on the SAT is a 24 <coughs> So what's a good score? Uh, you have to excuse some of these colleges are obviously Ohio, so this presentation was made by somebody in Ohio. But the point of this is, you, people ask me all the time, what's a good score? What's a good score? There's really no such thing as a good score. The Princeton Review, what we are well known for is what you're here tonight. We help students to improve their test scores. But on the other side of our business, we do college rankings. So all of this information is completely free at PrincetonReview.com. You can go on there, and if you're looking at Virginia State schools, you can look at all the Virginia State schools, see what their admission statistics are, see what scores you, know, you might need to get. So a good score is the score that gets you where you want to go. Okay? So your goal might be completely different from somebody else. I can't tell you what's a good score. I can't tell you what the average score is in the U.S., on average, students score about a 500 on each subject. So the average in the U.S. is typically around a 1,500, give or take a few points. Is that going get to get you into the school you want to go to? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that's what the 50th percentile score is. Okay? Um, so the way that they score the SAT, this is probably the only test that you'll ever take in your life where you actually are penalized for answering incorrectly. And this is very important for how you strategize. So when you answer a question correctly, you get one point. If you leave it blank, you get zero points. If you answer it incorrectly, you get a negative quarter of a point. Oh. If you touch the board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So if there we go. I went yeah. way ahead. I will not touch it again. So the point is, is when you take the SAT, you need to make sure, you know, people come down and they say, okay, so does that mean that I should be, should I guess, right? Because if you guess, you might get it wrong, right? And then you get that negative point. And I'm going to show you a practice problem where you determine whether it's better to guess or to leave it blank. So we actually, when we have our classes with students, the first thing we do with them is they're going to take a practice test to see how they're doing. Then they're going to tell us what their goals are, and we actually tell them how many questions they should answer. So you don't need to answer all of the questions to get the score that you want. It means you have to pick and choose. Get that low-hanging fruit to make sure you get the score you want, because if you answer it wrong, you're going to get that negative quarter of a point. Okay? So this is where the difference is between the SAT and the ACT. So this is showing you what's on the ACT, and you can see the format is a little bit different, right? So for the math that you're going to get on this, 
is the same as the SAT, except it does have trigonometry. And a lot of people go, ah, trigonometry. <laughs> With the trigonometry, there's really only about two or three problems. And you actually can do them without knowing trigonometry, so don't feel like you have to know the trigonometry <coughs> to get it correct. Um, a lot of it is going to be the strategies that you use. And then for the reading, it's going to have passages that you have to read to interpret the information. And then for the English, you're going to need to know grammar and punctuation. And then there is a science section, which you do not see on the SAT. Okay? So these particular problems, some people go, oh, I'm not very good in science. It's not necessarily that you need to know biology or some kind of specific science to be successful in this. It's more of how you analyze things. There's going to be graphs on here. And so some students are intimidated by this. I know when I was in high school, they said, you don't want to do the ACT. It's got trigonometry. It's like scary. <laughs> Whereas now, when I worked in admissions, I told students to take both. Almost any of the colleges that you're going to see out here are going to take, tell you to take both. And the reason for that is you might do better on one. And most schools are just going to take whichever you do better on. So that's going to help you with your admissions and with your scholarship money. And if you don't feel like making the commitment to taking one, the Princeton Review has free practice tests on our webpage. So you can go on there and try an SAT and you can try an ACT. And we actually have something called the Princeton Review Assessment, which is half and half. And it'll show you your score on both, so you can see, okay, I do better on this one, so maybe I should just focus my efforts on that, okay? The ACT, the highest score that you can get is a 36, okay? Which is a little different for some of us who are not quite used to that. I'm going through this quickly because we don't have that much time tonight, okay? So um, this shows the breakdown of how they do the scoring. So like I said, the highest score that you can get is a 36. But you're going to get a separate score for each one of those sections that I just showed you. And then they add these four, the top four together, and they divide it by four to get your composite score is what they call it. Okay? So that's how you get your ACT score, is by adding these four, the English, Math, Reading, and Science. The Writing section is a separate score, and it's optional. Okay? So you don't have to do the Writing section on the ACT. Okay? Again, it's the same thing with, an AC, with your ACT score as what I said with the SAT. The best ACT score you get is whatever gets you into the college that you're looking at. So, with the ACT, there is no penalty for answering incorrectly. So what does that mean? Don't leave any blank. Answer everything. You should always at least guess. Okay? So your strategy for the ACT is going to be different from your strategy for the SAT. All colleges accept either test. These are tests of skill um, and practice. So if you practice this, the reason that this is very important is because some students say, oh, I've got this really good GPA. I had a lot of students that would be applying for admissions. They have a really good GPA. I test good on other things, but I just can't get this test. Okay? The reason for that is because, as I mentioned before, these tests are not structured the way that your tests are in high school. Okay? So who can tell me, what does the SAT stand for? What does SAT stand for? Scholastic Aptitude Test? Anybody else? <coughs> okay. It actually doesn't stand for anything. <coughs> and why is that? Okay? Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say, I'm going to explain it to you in just a minute. How many of you think that men do better on the SAT? How many of you think women do better on the SAT? Got to do one or the other. So let's do that again. How many <laughs> think that men do better on the SAT? How many think women do better on the SAT? Okay. So the truth is men do better on the SAT than women. Who does better their first year of college? Men? Women? Women. Okay? So this is how we prove that this test does not measure how well you do in college and it does not measure your aptitude either. It was the scholastic aptitude test, but because it does not measure your intelligence, they were challenged on that. The Princeton Review sued them because we recognize that this is a very biased test. Okay? It does not measure your intelligence. And then they said, well, we're going to call it the standard achievement test. 
because it shows how well you do. Well, I just proved to you it doesn't show how well you do, right? So boys are doing better on the test, girls are doing better at college. Okay? So they were challenged on that as well. So now it's just SAT. Okay? It's just a brand. So that the reason I tell that story is because a lot of people feel like this is a very high pressure kind of thing, and it is. I'm not saying it's not important. But the point is, it is something that you can work on and you can beat. The SAT does not measure how smart you are. It does not measure how well you do in school. It measures how well you do the SAT. And we can tell you how to do well on the SAT. Okay? So that is something that you should take away from tonight. Um, so when you take a test in school, so the tests are long, there are too many questions, and there are trap answers. Okay? When you take a test in high school, how often do your teachers write a test for you that they know you probably can't finish in the amount of time you have class? That probably doesn't happen very often. They intentionally make the test so that you have to rush. You don't have infinite amount of time, okay? So that means that that goes into the tricky questions because they know you're not going to have time to look at it as much as you need to. And there are too many questions on each section. So that's going to be part of your strategy. So we're going to talk about strategy, okay? Slow down. <laughs> That's one of the things that people get really tempted on the SAT because I just told you, it's too long and there are too many questions. So what are you tempted to do? Oh gosh, i got to speed through this, right? Well, I just told you that it's actually better to sometimes leave things blank, right? So go through and find the ones that you know, okay? Make sure you answer the ones that you're sure about. And plus that will pump your ego up too. If you go through there and you get the ones that you know are right, and you're doing good, doing good, doing good, and you go, okay, I'm, I'm getting the questions right that I know, then you'll feel better about yourself, and then you can go back to the ones. It's, no, there's no, nowhere on the SAT or ACT that says that you have to take it in the order it's presented. Okay? So we'll talk more about that in just a second. So slow down, answer fewer questions, but get them right. Okay? So for guessing, this is what I promised I'd tell you more about. Okay? Um, with the ACT, you don't have to worry about it. Always guess. Always put something. Okay? Process of elimination. This is something that we really go over a lot in our classes. Process of elimination. Okay? You should guess on a question. If you look at a question and you feel like you can eliminate some of the answers because you know they're wrong, then you should guess, okay? Because statistically, you have a better chance of getting it right if you're able to eliminate something. If you cannot figure it out at all, then leave it blank, okay? Just leave it blank. And then if you have time, you can go back and think about it harder, okay? So, if you were to get this question on the SAT, what would you do at first? All right? Now. That's where a lot of people would say, I need to move on to the next one. This is where process elimination is important. Because what if these were your answers? <coughs> so don't let the question freak you out. Look at the answers. Because you can eliminate, even though you don't know the capital of Malawi, I don't know the capital of Malawi, you know these capitals, right? So you can eliminate those because you know those are capitals of other countries. This is a very simplified question. This is not an SAT question. This is simply for me to illustrate a process of elimination. Okay? So don't let the question itself freak you out. Okay. So the SAT versus the ACT, the biggest difference you're going to see is with the SAT, you're going to have trickier questions, but the concepts themselves are easier. Okay? Whereas with the, SAT, the ACT, the questions are going to be more straightforward but the concepts are more difficult. Okay? This is why you need to take both, because you don't know which one you test better. In reality, this is what you're more accustomed to in high school. Okay? Um, there's more technique with the SAT, which is where we come in to help you to get to know those test, writer, test writers to do better. This is more content-based. The SAT tests vocabulary, whereas the ACT does not. The SAT does not have the section, science section, whereas ACT does. And um, they have three sections on the SAT, and the ACT has four sections, plus some uh, optional writing. Okay. So that's the breakdown between the two tests. 
So this is what you should be doing each year, which for 10th grade, most of you probably already did this. I know there are a few sophomores in here who are going to be taking the PSAT. And so the summer before your junior year, you need to start looking at what your plan of action is for the following year. So for your 11th grade year, you need to take one of these tests or both of these tests at least once. Okay? The most popular test date for the SAT is going to be March, and ACT is going to be around the same time frame, usually around April, okay, for your junior year. And then your second, um, excuse me, for your 12th grade year in the fall, you're going to need to take it for a second time. Third, I would not do that unless you're just really struggling and you see a big improvement, okay? Because it is very time consuming and the fewer times you take it, the better it's going to work. So these are the test dates when they're offered. You're going to be able to know this from your school. Um, I've met with your counselors here. I've talked to Dr. John or excuse me, Mr. Johnson. And so you're going to know when these are coming up and they're going to be able to help you to register, but make sure that you talk to your counselors a lot about what your act plan of action is for taking this and when you're going to take it. Okay? So as I mentioned, you need to prepare to take each one at least one, each test at least once and plan on taking it twice. And don't take either one more than three times. Okay? Okay? So speaking of super score, um, this is how I did it in my admissions office, and this is the way most admissions offices do. Now ETS, um, ETS is the, is the people who make the SAT. Okay? It doesn't matter what it stands for. It's what we call them. evil testing services. <laughs> Not important. Okay, but they have now made it so that you can choose to have one of your scores eliminated, so that college admissions offices can't see it. I only, I don't recommend doing that because typically what happens is if you take the SAT twice and you do better on the math one time and better on the verbal another time, they will do what they call super score and they will just take the best from each time you take it. Okay, so you want to make sure that if you did better on one, make it so you get the best possible score combination possible. They're just going to take whatever is your highest from each time. Does that make sense? So what do they look at, at your, on your application? I'm sure they've already talked to you about this a little bit, but they're going to be looking at your academic rigor, your GPA, your test scores, and your academic curiosity. Academic curiosity simply means where are you looking at taking classes outside of your life, okay? So this is not, um, these percentages that I'm showing you are not across the board. <coughs> Every admissions office is completely different. So the Prince Interview, we're very big on doing our rankings and our surveys, and we surveyed um, colleges across the country, and on average, this is what we got for results. On average, college admissions offices take 40% of your consideration as your transcript, transcript, which is your GPA and your rigor, okay? Did you take difficult classes? And your college admissions tests are going to be 20% of what they're looking at. So that makes up 60% of the consideration that they're looking at. Now this is just an average, okay? And on average, we've surveyed students. Most students don't spend more than 15 hours preparing. Okay? You probably want to do more than that. Our classes are 30 hours, okay? So this is where we're going to start talking a little bit about strategy. When you take the SAT, I'm sure they've already told you this, but it's going to increase in difficulty as you go through a section. So what does that mean? The first problem you get on a section is going to be the easiest, and the last question in a section is going to be the hardest. That is incredibly useful knowledge, because when I was talking about guessing, there is no difference in the amount of points you get between that number one question and that number 20 question, okay? So if you get to number 20 in a section and you say, this was easy, well, maybe you just got tripped, okay? <laughs> so you might want to step back and look at it a little bit closer. We actually have shown statistically that only 8% of the population gets the 20th question right. So do you think that you're in that 8%? If not, you might want to leave it blank. Okay? So take that into consideration. Okay. I want 
you got the reason for the way that they do these tests is because you are predictable. That's why only 8% get that right, because they probably put an answer on there that you thought was easy, and people were attracted to that. So this is an example of why we're predictable. I want everybody to think of a number. Get a number in your head. Get a number in your head. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> So how many of you picked a number over a thousand? How many of you picked a number over a hundred? How many of you picked a fraction? Decimal? Fraction? Okay. How many of you picked a number between one and ten? <laughs> Did I say to pick a number between one and ten? Okay. So you're predictable. Also another one. And this one is a little bit, you probably heard this one before. So what do cows drink? <laughs> okay. It's okay if you thought milk first. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Do they drink milk or do they produce milk? Okay? It's all right. But that's how, you know, they know. They've studied this for years and years and years. Okay? These are not SAT questions, but the human mind, they know who is in the 92% and who's in the 8%. Okay? Okay, so this is a sample question, okay? So take a minute to read it. Parents, are you having flashbacks? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay. okay, so when you first read this, the first thing I want to say is, well, who cares about Tom, okay? But this is something that you're going to get. And so when I was talking about guessing or not, okay, so some people might be tempted to skip. The average student would want to skip this because they're going to get intimidated by all those words, okay? The next kind of student is going to get out their, you know, pen, their pencil, and they're going to start doing something like, okay, T is Tom, and he's equal to 2L, you know, all that kind of good algebra stuff. And about 17 steps later, they might have an answer. And somewhere in those 17 steps, they might get mixed up. And I guarantee one of these answers is going to be somewhere where you get mixed up. And you're, so you, you see what I'm getting at, okay? So this is where we teach plugging in. And I know you do this in class, but this is going to be your best friend in the math portion. So how do you go about plugging in? Well, when you get an answer, when you get a question like this, the very first thing you have to decide is, okay, I don't even know where to start. Where am I going to start plugging in? Well, you can see these numbers are pretty well spread out, right? So what I would do is I would go for that middle number, because this is going to help you to eliminate pretty quickly, okay? So as you go through, you pretended, okay, so let's say Tom is 18, okay? So you just plugged it in. So then you just go through the problem, and you say Tom is twice as old as Linda. So we know that Linda, in this case, would be, what, 36, right? Oh, no, she's half as old, sorry. I'm already getting wrong, okay. So <coughs> Linda is nine, because she's half as old as him, okay? And so Karen, is going to be four years older than Linda, so she's going to be 13, okay? And then we have Brian, and Karen is one-third as old as Brian, which means Brian is three times older, so he's going to be 39, who will be twice as old as Tom next year, okay? So next year, Brian's going to be 40, and next year, Tom is going to be 19, right? Well, we can see this didn't work out, right? So our plugging in didn't work out. That's okay, though, because it told us a lot, okay? We know that 18 is wrong, so we can eliminate 18 is not the right answer. What else can we eliminate? Yeah, we can eliminate G and E as well because they're not big enough. The number has to be bigger than, right? So if you're pushed for time, you have already eliminated three of the answers. So you have a 50-50 chance of getting this one right. So you definitely guess. So if it's like the end of the test, you were one of those people that skipped it and came back, you have five seconds, you can guess and make a pretty good guess. And so what you would do from here if you did have time though, is you would probably go to the next number up, which would be 22. And if you go through the whole process, you're going to find that 22 is the right answer. Okay? And that was
is much easier, right? <laughs> so make sure that you start using some plugging in techniques because this isn't high school. This is a test. If you did this on some of your high school pick math stuff, they would get you get in trouble because this is not what they want to see. The, your, your teacher probably wants to see the work done, and this is not it. But nobody's looking at your work on the SAT. <laughs> okay? So I'm not saying do this in school, <laughs> just do this when you're doing the SAT. Okay, we're running low on time, so we're just going to do one more. So if Elizabeth played six instruments equally well, her blank musical skills made her a valuable member of the orchestra. So this is a sample question. So what we tell for students to do here, you're going to get vocabulary that's going to be, that you're going to have to put in there. But the reason I've presented to you this way is because what you need to do before you ever look at the answer bank is you need to put a word in there that you think makes sense. So if I read that, I would say, well, you know, she plays a lot of musical instruments, so you can put any word in there that you want. I would just say her diverse musical skills, right? That's a word you know. The reason for this is because if you don't know the vocabulary down here, sometimes you're just going to want to put in a word you know it might not be the right word, okay? So here's the answer choices that you have. So we put diverse, so we know that's not the same as grandiose, we can get rid of that one, okay? But it makes sense, okay? So that's what you have to go back and look is, it would make sense there, it doesn't make the sentence wrong, but it's not the word we're looking for. So you can get rid of grandiose, you can get rid of residual, you can get rid of pristine, fluent, it's pretty easy to get down to versatile once you've already put that in there. But if you had gone to this first and simply tried to put it in, a lot of these would make okay sense, but it's not the right one. Okay? So that's the strategy we use for sentence completion. Okay? So I had more, but we didn't have much time tonight. So what we can do is if you pass your cards forward, I'm going to raffle off the books. And I will be happy to answer questions. Does anybody have any questions? I know that we've been through this. It's a very big topic. It's hard to cover a lot in 30 minutes. And are there similar strategies for the ACT? Yes, yes. I only got to go through a few SAT questions. So with the Princeton Review, like I mentioned, we have free practice tests that you can take on our webpage, and we have the strategies there. We offer courses for both SAT and ACT, and we use our strategies and methodologies to ensure that students increase their scores on either test type that they use. If you decided to take an SAT course with us, you also get access to all of our ACT information on our online tools too. So with the Princeton Review, you get accessibility to them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and raffle off some books, and I'll stick around and answer specific questions afterwards. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to give away one of our best 377 colleges. Is Tennille here? You don't have to be here to win. <laughs> How about Asia? Thomas? How about Mandy McCray? She's not <laughs> Okay, we can give away one of our SAT books now. How about uh, Suedra? I'm sorry. Suedra Ewing? Suedra. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tend to butcher people's names. Jonathan? Petra. There you go. All right. That's our cracking the SAT. It's the only test prep book that has ever been on the New York Times bestseller. Wow. Oh, Jay Rotham. It's kind of sorry. All right. It's beyond the average attention span. <laughs> well, it just kind of. <laughs> There you go. Okay, and I've got a couple more books for SAT. Rion Slate. Trey Rush. Right. This is our 11 practice test, so you'll get plenty of practice tests. And then I have one more small book. It's just a crash course in the SAT. 
uh, Miranda Brown. All right. Congratulations. And I'll stick around in case you guys have any more questions.